Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to give you a chance to join. You see the attendee numbers going up steadily. So as soon as that slows down, we can get into the presentation. Hope everyone's having a great Thursday afternoon. while we're give, giving everyone a chance to join. If you have not done so already, please take this opportunity to grab the RFO documents so that you can have them at the ready while we go through the presentation. And I see those numbers are slowing down a bit, so. I'm just going to go ahead and get started. So thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. You are here for the solicitation conference for the Texas Digital Identity Solution and Identity Access Management Assessments RFO conference. This is listed as DIR CPO STS 576 on the ESPD website in case you like a lot of numbers and letters at the same time so early on in the presentation. And just to say again, if you have not had an opportunity to do so already, please take this chance to grab the RFO documents so that you can have them ready as we go along through the presentation. Next slide. Before we get started, we would like to go over a few housekeeping rules. We would like to remind everyone that you can change your audio between your computer and your phone call. All attendees are muted. If everyone could please raise their hand to confirm that they can hear, hear good. Perfect. OK, go ahead and lower them. Um, we ask that you submit all questions via the Q&A box. The chat will be disabled. And this handout will be available in the addendum. So we want to start with brief introductions of everyone who will be speaking on this call. So Julie, thank you so much for starting off. You're welcome. Uh, I'm Julie Arby. I'm a procurement team lead here at DIR in the chief procurement office. And I'm kind of standing in for uh, Amy uh, Fluger, who is our director, who was not uh, able to be here today. I'll hand it to Wendy. Good afternoon. I'm Wendy Maserona, the director of the Share Technology Services project engineering. Jody. Hi, this is Jody Erickson. I'm the Director of Shared Services Finance. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Susie Hilliard. I'm Deputy Chief Information Security Officer, um, and I am over security services. Good afternoon. I am Lynn Hottie Blue. I'm the Deputy Chief Procurement Officer at DIR, and I also serve as the agency's hub coordinator. Good afternoon. I am Janie Weber, and I am an Assistant General Counsel at DIR. Good afternoon. This is Marie Cohan. I am the Statewide Digital Accessibility Program Administrator. And good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jonica Amafadun. I am the Procurement Lead for the TDIS slash IAMA procurement that we are discussing today. Next slide. So I'll briefly go over the agenda. Um, we will be going over the Share Technology Services Overview, the RFO Overview, your response submission, evaluation criteria, discussions and invitations to negotiate, hub subcontracting plans, your EIR accessibility forms, some matters of law and exceptions, general information and submitting questions. We'll have a brief break to go over any questions that have been added. Um, to the Q&A chat feature. 
and then we will close out the conference. So if you have the RFO in front of you, which we strongly encourage, we will go through it mostly in order if you'd like to take notes or jot down any questions as we go along. Please use the Q&A feature to ask questions and we will take time towards the end of the session to address them. Please submit your in-conference questions before the break scheduled in the latter part of this conference call. This break is the time we will use to review questions and provide answers if possible. Any answers provided today are not official until they are included in an addendum posted to the ESBD. Next slide. First, just want to let you know that we are recording this conference and it will be posted as an addendum on the ESBD. Uh, I do want to reiterate while you are opening the RFO, hint, hint, we can address one of the questions that we always get. Again, yes, we will be recording this webinar. The link will be provided via an addendum which will be posted to the ESBD along with the slide deck, attendees list, and any questions we may be able to answer from this session. Please check the ESBD often. We will be doing a rolling Q&A, which means we will answer questions as fast as we can and post them to the ESBD versus holding all of the questions until the end of the Q&A period. Please read the Q&A documents as your questions may have already been asked and answered. With these housekeeping items out of the way, I will turn it over to Wendy. Good afternoon. I'm Wendy Mazzarana, the Director of the Share Technology Services Project Engineering Team, and I shall be providing an overview of the Share Technology Services Program. Next slide, please. The Share Technology Services, or STS, program is a portfolio of cost-effective, reliable, secure, managed IT services. It consists of multiple contracts with multiple service providers. With STS, DIR leverages the buying power of the great state of Texas and extends those pre-negotiated cost-effective services to our customers. Through the STS program, DIR customer government entities have an avenue to obtain these modern IT services, providing peace of mind through STS assurances for security, standardization, disaster recovery, and digital transformation. Bottom line, STS allows our DIR customers to focus on their core missions to serve Texas residents. Next slide, please. The SCS program, again, is composed of multiple services and service providers. Starting at the top, we have our MSI, the Multi-Sourcing Services Integrator, who provides the service management platform, tools, governance, processes, and services for the full STS program. We'll discuss the MSI more over the next few slides. Beyond the MSI, we have multiple service components for the Data Center Services Program, providing private and public cloud infrastructure and networking, mainframe, technology solution services, bulk print mail and digitization services, and security operations. Next box over, we have Texas.gov, through which DIR offers payment processing, application development and maintenance, the Texas by Texas Digital Assistant in support of the Texas.gov websites. MSS, Managed Security Services, provides managed security services, obviously, with device management, incident response, and risk and compliance services. On the far right, we have the Open Data Portal, the States of Texas, official repository for publicly available electronic data. And second to the right, Digital Identity, also known as Texas Digital Identity Solution, TDIS, and Identity Access Management Assessments, IAMA. To date, the TDIS MFA, multi-factor authentication, is provided under the Texas.gov services provider. Given the criticality and need for digital identity services across the shared technology services platform, through this procurement, DIR is bringing digital identity to the forefront 
by making digital identity or the TDIS, Texas Digital Identity Solution, Identity Access Management Assessments, a unique service component within the STS program. Susie Hilliard will delve into the specifics of the digital identity service component in a few slides, but first, next slide, please. The service integration model. In our shared technology services program, we leverage our MSI, our multi-sourcing services integrator, as the service integrator to ensure seamless service delivery and provide a single point of contact or entry point for our customers. The MSI provides our STS portal based on the ServiceNow platform. It provides our STS program policies, processes, and procedures in support of our idle functions. MSI provides financial management, service level management, and reporting for all of the service components within the STS program. In order for our service integration model to work, each service provider within STS must engage collaboratively and partner with MSI and the other service component providers to deliver services consistently and seamlessly. This item is critical. DIR expects each service component provider in the program to approach their service delivery as one cohesive share technology services unit, representing STS with one voice. In support of the partnering and collaboration, the Exhibit 1 Statement of Work in the RFO package lists requirements for each service component provider to enter into operating agreements with the MSI and other service component providers. These operating agreements will include MSI to SCP or service component provider, as well as service component provider to service component provider agreements that address processes, protocols, and communications for everything from operations and incidents to requests for solution to security and issue resolution and governance to ensure our consistent service delivery. Next slide, please. Okay, I admit there's a lot on this slide. In Exhibit 1, DIR has documented at length the cross-functional services provided by our MSI. DIR requires each service component provider to collaborate and partner with the MSI and other SCPs through technical and procedural integration as identified in the Statement of Work. You probably already think I am a broken record on this topic. I am. It is that critical to the success of the Share Technology Services Program. This diagram highlights the cross-functional platform provided by our MSI. This platform is key to the success of delivering these seamless services to DIR customers across the life cycle of ordering, provisioning, updating, invoicing, reporting, monitoring, and managing all STS services. As mentioned earlier, the MSI provides these services and functions through our Share Technology Services Portal, leveraging ServiceNow as our business management platform. Along with ServiceNow, there are additional tools supporting the IT financial management, service level management and training, but ServiceNow is the entry point for all STS operations and reporting. All STS services are requested, tracked, and reported through our STS portal. All invoicing and all customer approvals are captured through the STS portal. So for avoidance of doubt, the STS portal is our system of record. Some key areas of the cross-functional solution tools and dependencies provided by the MSI are the marketplace, which includes the portal, service desk, service catalog, and outreach and growth functions. Business management with our financial chargeback systems and processes, performance management, and operational intelligence. Operations management, data quality management, and workflow orchestration. Next, we have service management, which includes our idle functions, for incident, problem, change, requests, disaster recovery, configuration, and asset management. 
At the across the bottom, you also see governance, which includes our service management manuals, documenting all of our policies, processes, and procedures, as well as training. Then on the far right, we have data integration, which is e-discovery, software license compliance, and automated provisioning. Because the STS portal and cross-functional services are provided in the program by the MSI, respondents should not include in their response any costs related to the services, systems, or processes provided by the MSI. Next slide, please. This slide is a slightly different view of the multi-sourcing model to clarify which services are provided through the STS program and which are unique to digital identity. Starting in the top box middle column, DIR retains ownership, responsibility, and accountability for strategy, service operations, procurement of STS services, technology planning, and our chief information security office. Directly below is the MSI, who we've just discussed, provides the service platform, policy, process, procedure, governance, IT financial management, IT service level management, service desk, and marketplace. On the right, the data center services, or DCS, provides the infrastructure on which the TDIS platform is hosted. The digital identity solution must be hosted within data center services. DCS also facilitates technology planning and other infrastructure services. On the bottom right, we highlighted one of our DCS service components, the SecOps or Security Operations Service Component Provider. The SecOps SCP provides security oversight for data center services and sets the security standards and configurations for the program within our Master Security Baseline Configurations or MSBC. All DCS infrastructure must adhere to our security standards and processes, including reporting into the Security Incident and Event Management System, or SIM, provided by SAIC. Leverage this slide to assist you in identifying areas of service provided by DIR, MSI, or DCS, and the services unique to digital identity, as indicated in the box on the left services specific to digital identity, such as IAM assessments, the TDIS application development, testing, and maintenance, application security, technical currency, logical database and middleware services, and integration into the MSI and our cross-functional services. Reminder, integration with and use of the MSI's platform, tools, and processes is required for all STS service providers. These elements are, that are retained by MSI, DCS, or DIR should not be considered within your pricing. For this RFO, we are asking you to submit your proposal, your solution, along with any assumptions or dependencies or integration areas with MSI or other SEPs. To help with your response, DIR has created a data room as part of this procurement that houses additional information germane to this procurement, including additional detail about our established processes and governance model. DIR encourages each respondent to leverage the information in the data room as you prepare your response. Jonica and Mofanon will discuss the data room in more detail a little later in this presentation. Next slide, please. The primary elements of our performance model are service level agreements and critical deliverables. Within our STS performance model, we have both critical and key service levels. The primary difference between them is critical service levels have financial credits attached to them, credits that DIR assesses in the event a service level is missed, while the key service levels do not have the financial credits. The Exhibit 1 Statement of Work and attachments 1.1 and 1.2 within the RFO package define the service levels for this digital identity procurement. Attachment 1.1 of the RFO package also defines the critical deliverables. We have one-time and recurring critical deliverables for the digital identity program. These deliverables are documents or reports 
that must be done accurately and delivered on time, lest service delivery or the program is impacted. We've defined in the attachment 1.1 of the RFO, the specific deliverables for digital identity that DIR has deemed as critical. These critical deliverables also have financial credits attached to them. So we've talked about the financial credits, but how does the program incent performance? We include opportunities for service providers to earn back any financial credits. DIR also has the unilateral right to add, modify, elevate, and or delete service levels. And we get asked every RFO negotiation, surely you're not serious with this unilateral right. Yes, we absolutely are, and here's why. We cannot possibly place a service level, critical or otherwise, on every measure that is important to our customers' business needs and the DIR programs. The program would be in the untenable position of trying to manage hundreds of SLAs for a single service provider. We want our providers to be incented as if there were service levels on all aspects of the services. We do not want to sacrifice service in one area to ensure the service level in another area is met. We want that consistent, smooth service delivery at all times in all areas. The benefit to the service component provider with this model is that there are not hundreds of these critical or even key service levels within digital identity or any service component. And it allows DIR to manage and monitor a smaller number of service levels with the ability to adjust to ensure that smooth, consistent service delivery to meet the business needs of the program. In your review of attachment 1.2 of the RFO, you'll notice there are some service levels identified as related. For example, incident resolution time. These service levels are shared with the MSI, and in some cases, other service component providers in areas where that cross SCP collaboration is operationally identified. Related SLAs ensure all parties associated with the service are incented to attain that SLA. And finally, we have service level improvement plan process the MSI manages. If a service level is repeatedly missed, MSI has a documented process to perform root cause analysis with the service component provider and develop action items designed to improve service level attainment and delivery of services. The STS program is committed to the robust performance model incenting high levels of service delivery. Next slide. Completely switching gears from cross-functional integrations, the MSI and SLAs, let's talk about key personnel. DIR has designated in the Exhibit 1 Statement of Work key named positions for this contract, as indicated on the left on this slide. We expect a 24-month commitment from contract execution, also known as the effective date, for each of these named key personnel in the Statement of Work. DIR requires an organization chart in which we expect you to clearly define lines of authority and accountability for your contract. We need to know who is the sole person accountable for and with the authority to make decisions for your organization on this agreement. You'll also know in the Exhibit 1 Statement of Work, DIR may review the performance of the successful respondents team to ensure the resources and skill sets align with achieving the program's goals, to ensure that we have the right staff with the right skills to meet our business needs. A little later in the presentation, DIR will discuss the RFO response package and the evaluation criteria. Lest there be any doubt, DIR expects named resources in these key roles, along with the organizational structure, indicating clear lines of authority as part of your response package. With that, my time has come to an end and I turn it over to Susie Hilliard. Everybody brought their best speaking voice today. I'm gonna to see if I can hold up to their level. So um, I am uh, Susie Hilliard, uh, Deputy CISO over Security Services. And I am here to tell you about the actual scope of work, about what we are really truly looking for. So um, we are looking for a vendor that can um, maintain and um, develop and continue installations of TDIS to DIR customers. 
We want you, um, our vendor partner, to develop marketing and outreach, perform outreach, um, and deploy IAM assessments to our customers. And then we do that we integrating by integrating into the STS model that Wendy um, very eloquently discussed in the previous slides, um, and that's working with the multi-sourcing services integrator, the MSI, along with the other service component providers, or um, as we love our acronyms, SCPs. Um, we um, we would love, um, we are requiring, we would love, and we are requiring um, this successful respondent to participate in the outreach and growth program to really get TDIS out to, um, to state agencies and eligible customers. Um, and we want you to do the same with assessments. Um, and then finally, we want um, that technology evolution that really can help us um, make sure that we are continuing to evolve um, the services and products that we offer to the next level. Next slide, please. Um, here's a current overview of our of, of this of the TITA solution. Keep in mind most of the architectural diagrams, um, the detail, um, everything about um, everything about the technical components of TDIS is in the data room um, that should help you to formulate a successful response. Um, but the TDIS services are provided through, uh, currently provided through the Texas.gov services contract with Deloitte. Um, uh, we use the Forge Rock um, platform to deliver TDIS. Uh, we provide multi-factor authentication and single sign-on access to Texas government organizations and their employees. Um, this enables secure access to authorized systems, and the solution includes access management, identity management and governance, a user dashboard, centralized audit log collecting and alerting, and it is hosted in the DCS public cloud. Okay, next slide, please. Regarding assessments, what we were looking for is a, is a way to really help our customers understand where their identity program is at today and what steps can they take to add and add to their program and really give them a meaningful and successful, secure um, access management program. So what we are looking for is we are looking for someone to be able to come in and really get a good baseline of a customer's environment, evaluate the current state of where that customer is regarding their IAM processes, policies, and governance. We want to make sure that through the assessment, um, any security risks and compliance gaps are identified and pointed out. And then we want to also kind of look at basically defining more rigorous security standards. How can you apply more security in a better way and more effective to the customer? Um, we also are looking for the, for the assessment to one of the outcomes of the assessment um, should be recommendations on how they can better secure and manage um, their identity landscape. Um, in return, hopefully, um, some of these recommendations can help minimize risk of breaches and attacks um, and better prepare the customer for the true level of effort that's going to be needed um, to implement um, some of the to implement those recommendations because it putting IAM in an environment it's a lot of work and we understand that and we want the customer to have a realistic expectation of what they're in for next slide please and with that, I turn it back over to Wendy. Oh, no, 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 this is still mine. I'm sorry. I apologize. I was wrong on that. Okay. Um, in addition, finally, um, one of the things that we... <laughs> One of the um, one of the things that we are asking this vendor to do is a transformation project. Um, we have had a roadmap for TDIS um, for um, a, a while now, and um, we have been able to um, implement most of the items on that roadmap. But there are a few items that still need to be addressed, and we are expecting the new vendor to um, finish these items. So, what we are looking for um, major elements um, are include um, modifications to the TDIS portal, 
uh, which is adding additional enrollment flexibility. And just as an FYI, these are um, really kind of defined between the SOW, between the SOW, the scope of work section two, and um, documented in the data room as well. Um, we are also looking to um, add security enhancements to access management functions. We are looking to strengthen the security position of passwords and accounts. Um, we are constantly looking for ways to evolve to make sure to keep up with the evolving security technology around MFA. Um, and then we're also looking to um, enhance the reporting cap capabilities. Okay. And with that, I turn it over to <laughs> turn it back over. Thank, Thank you, you, Susie. <laughs> okay, I'm going to take a second to let everyone digest all of that information that they just heard. Um, before I dive into the RFO overview, just want to say you're going to be hearing my voice for a very long time. So just a, just a, a warning. Uh, as a reminder, my name is Jonica Amafida. I am the procurement lead for this RFO. I'm gonna spend some time here talking about the RFO contents, the response requirements, the contract term, and the RFO schedule, and conclude with some pointers and things to remember. Next slide, please. First things first, some general information about this RFO. As Wendy and Susie just mentioned, this RFO is only for the Texas Digital Identity Solution and Identity Access Management Assessments Services. DIR expects to make a single award for these services. Uh, currently, we believe that the vendor who is currently awarded the Multi-Sourcing Services Integrator MSI contract will be precluded from award of any SDS contract for which the MSI will have oversight responsibilities, including this STS, TDIS, and IAM assessments contract. Next slide, please. This slide and the next list the contents of the RFO. We will spend some time going over the RFO content so that it will be very beneficial to have your RFO open in front of you so you can make notes as we go along. So again, please make sure to read the RFO in detail. What you will find when you go into the RFO are the attachments, the exhibits, and just wanna make it clear, attachments are labeled A through F, Exhibits have numbers, and if you go to the next slide, the contract documents for the MSA with exhibits are listed as attachments A through E. Next slide. As we mentioned before, DIR is seeking a successful respondent to serve as the STS TDIS and IAM assessments SCP. Transitioning management of DIR's current Texas Digital Identity Solution, TDIS, which will include the ability to formulate enhancements to the successful respondent while also implementing IAM assessments for DIR customers to better meet specific customer needs and improve the overall cybersecurity position of the state. Individualized assessments need to be available for DIR customers. The successful respondent must meet these minimum qualifications. Five or more years experience providing similar digital identity solutions and services, and within the last five years have held at least three contracts for similar major activities with a minimum total contract value of $1 million. Next slide, please. The single contract award from this RFO will have an initial term of three years with an option to renew for up to three additional years for a total contract award of no more than six years at DIR's discretion. Next slide. Please familiarize yourself with this slide. This would be the schedule. We are at the highlighted position, the solicitation conference today. So the rolling Q&A is going on now. Please submit your questions as soon as possible. While the formal Q&A submission deadline is October 2nd, 
at 2 p.m. I would not suggest holding your questions until October 2nd at 2 p.m. We will be answering questions as they come in. Feel free to read others' questions. It might be helpful to you. And someone might have already asked the same question that you are thinking about asking. Questions and answers help to reduce any assumptions that you will need to make for your response. Of note, responses are due by October 16th, 2023 at 2 p.m. Central Time. Let me state that again, you will be quizzed later on. The response deadline is October 16th, 2023 at 2 p.m. Central Time. Late responses will not be considered and a minute late is considered late. We anticipate an award recommendation in May of 2024 with transition beginning at the end date of award through November 30th of 2024. Next slide. To aid in answering any questions you may have, we have a digital data room that is open for this procurement. Please review the documents in the data room before submitting questions about the RFO. Many of the pertinent answers can be found there. I do want to take this opportunity to stress the following items. When submitting an access request, you must use your official company name as listed on the Secretary of State website. We need your official business name, which is the name you are registered to do business as in the state of Texas. This official business name, which is the same name as registered on the Secretary of State website, and the one you are registered to do business as in the state of Texas must match the registered name you use for Hub. In essence, please make sure your names match. If they don't match, we cannot grant you access to the data room and that will hamper further steps in the RFO process for you. That being said, you do need to request access and submit a signed NDA before access is granted to the data room. The link in section 3.3.3 of the RFO takes you to a landing page that provides instructions on requesting access. Let me reiterate, NDAs for the data room access must include your legal entity name of your business. I cannot stress that enough. Next slide, please. We're gonna go a little bit deeper and we're gonna cover what you will be submitting in your official response submission. Next slide. There are four required response items that must be included. They are your response packages one through four and they're listed on this slide. If you do not provide the four response packages and all of the required files for each, your response may be found non-responsive. I'm going to outline the contents of each of these packages in the next few slides. If you have any questions regarding the required response packages, please be sure to submit your questions, to DIR. Next slide, please. So as you see listed, these are the response contents. You have response packages one through four. Some two key takeaways regarding the response submission are provided on this slide. First, you are expected to submit four separate zip files to DIR as your response. The zip file should contain the required files for each package as described in the RFO. Files should be labeled according, accordingly per the instructions in the RFO. They do not need to be submitted in separate emails, however. Um, if you do run into technical issues when you are trying to submit a single email with your four zipped files, you may split your emails but please ensure that you clearly indicate that you are doing so within the body of your email response so we could know to expect a certain number of emails from you. Second, respondents should submit your response via email to the email address identified on this slide and in the RFO. That would be the Enterprise 576 email address. No late responses will be accepted. 
And I just want to say it again, responses are due October 16th at 2 p.m. Central Time. Please ensure you submit with enough time for DIR to receive your response by the required time and date. Start early. A minute late is late and your response will not be considered, unfortunately. If you do have any technical issues submitting, you can reach out to DIR via the Enterprise 576 email address and we will do our best to help you as much as possible. However, if you are raising an issue with one to two minutes before the submission deadline, it is unlikely that your issue will be resolved with enough time remaining for you to submit. If you are 30 seconds late, you're, you're late. Next slide, please. Now we're going to move into the response files for each package. Package number one is for the administrative submission requirements. The required files are shown here on the slide and also identified in the RFO in section 3.5.12. We will address the majority of the required files for this response package later in this presentation, so I will not go through them at this time. Next slide, please. Response package number two is your response to the service requirements, including the technical solution and transition components, as well as information regarding your experience as outlined here on the slide and in the RFO section 3.5.13.1. Of note, the technical solution has some major components. Your narrative response labeled technical solution summary and submitted as a Word doc and your solution overview which includes a tooling matrix for a listing of software that you intend to utilize as part of your solution offering. Your response to transition has two major components. The narrative response labeled transition approach, submitted as a Word document, and a transition project plan. The transition project plan should be developed using Microsoft Project, but should be submitted in Excel and or PDF format as the evaluation team may not have access to Microsoft Project. And we've outlined that here in the table to include either the Excel version and a PDF form. The remaining files include your experience, your disclosure of any terminated contracts, your proposed account organization. And I wanna make a special note here the personnel listed in your organizational structure should be current employees, not future employees you plan to hire, and your exceptions. The response requirements for these items are straightforward and the instructions for responding are included in the RFO. We will touch on exceptions later in this presentation when we get to matters of law. Next slide, please. The last two required response packages are listed above and are very important. Your pricing information is provided in response package number three. You should complete attachment 2.1 per the instructions in the RFO. We will review the instructions for this on the next slide and in more detail. Response package number four includes your hub subcontracting plan. Lynn will go into the hub subcontracting plan in depth later in this presentation. But before we get to Lynn, I will pass the baton to Jody to talk more about pricing. Hello, uh, Jody Erickson here, and I'll be covering the next three pricing related slides. Uh, there are four documents that are important when putting together your pricing response, and they include Exhibit 2, Attachment 2.1, 2.2, and 2.3 that are listed and described here on this slide, uh, you should complete and return attachment 2.1 with all costs that your entity intends to bill DIR or DIR customers per the RFO and attachment 2.1 instructions. Exhibit two, the financial pricing provisions and pricing, essentially the words that describe the numbers, Attachment 2.2, the financial responsibility matrix, and attachment 2.3, the skill set descriptions are informational and you don't, do not need to return them with your response. Next slide, please. 
this slide has more highlights related to um, attachment 2.1 in particular. Regarding respondent pricing assumptions, please leverage the Q&A process that Jonica Jost was talking about to attempt to eliminate as many pricing assumptions as possible prior to submitting your proposal. Let me say that again, we'd like you to use that Q&A process to attempt to eliminate pricing assumptions prior to submitting your response. The Q&A process is there to obtain information you need and clear up any uncertainty you may have so that your proposal can be comprehensive. If you do decide to include an assumption, marking that pricing impact as TBD is not an acceptable response. If the assumption does not have a pricing impact, please don't just leave it blank. Please mark the impact as $0. Uh, continuing on under key, and key considerations, if you have questions related to any of the definitions used throughout the pricing documents, please refer to the definitions section of Exhibit 1. And as Wendy referenced earlier, we want you to pay close attention to the MSI section of the statement of work and be sure that your pricing does not include activities that are MSI responsibilities. For rate card, be sure your rates are inclusive of travel. For transition, which includes all pre and post commencement, non-recurring or one-time type work, make sure that um, you understand for exhibit two, that any milestones accepted prior to commencement will be invoiced as part of the first invoice cycle at commencement. Additionally, we want to emphasize that we are not expecting large transition costs due to the assumption of retaining the environment as is. For volume discounts, we are expecting you to complete this tab as part of your initial submission. Put your best foot forward. We believe the state and customers should financially benefit as the program grows. Next slide, please. This slide covers solution software and hopefully clears up some of the questions you may be having related to software. I would also highly recommend you refer to all posted Q&A responses when available for additional insight and keep referring back to Q&A responses throughout the RFO uh, process. The first item relates to public cloud infrastructure and related infrastructure software licenses. These items should not be included in your pricing as PCM, as the PCM vendor will directly bill DIR for these items. The same hold, holds true for any additional expansion if we're receiving, if they support TDIS and they are part of expansion services from PCM, PCM will bill these directly to DIR and not the respondent. The next three categories, Forge Rock, Secret Double Octopus, my favorite, Splunk and Twilio are all currently licensed by the incumbent and assignable. These items should all be included in your 2.1 price submission in accordance with the 2. Exhibit 2 guidelines. And finally, Nagios is open source, but if there's any associated costs, be sure to include that in your pricing as well. I think that wraps it up for me. So turning it back over. Thanks, Jody. So finally, we wanna call out some key things to remember as you submit your response. It's very important. Please be sure that your attachment A is signed when you submit it. You will be disqualified if this is not signed or if this is missing or not submitted. You must submit and provide evidence that you meet the minimum qualifications identified in the RFO in the qualification requirements document that's included as part of response package one. Be sure to review the other pass-fail criteria in the RFO section 4.2.1 pass-fail criteria to ensure that you are in compliance. Next slide, please. 
So there's a lot of attachments listed on this slide and I'll go through them um, very briefly. That does not diminish their importance, however. Attachments C, D, and E are in fact very important. And we will discuss these further with Marie in just a bit. Attachment F, respondent release of liability, is required for both your references and your terminated contracts. This is very important and may impact the scoring of your response. Also, please remember that providing a signed copy of page one of each addendum is strongly recommended. However, it is not mandatory. You will be held to all terms and requirements of each addenda, regardless of the provision of a signed first page. It is very important to keep up with the ESVD to view the published addenda. Expect multiple addenda to be posted, given we are going to have a rolling Q&A period and each set of questions and answers will be posted via an addenda. In summary, make sure to complete all of your attachments. Follow the instructions and complete them thoroughly. Some of these attachments include mandatory information and some attachments are scored. So again, this is very important. Next slide, please. In submitting your response, make sure to also complete attachments A, B, C, and D. A quick recap of what those are. Attachment A is your respondent information form. Attachment B is your hub subcontracting plan or HSP. Attachment C is your policy driven adoption for accessibility or PDAA vendor self-assessment. And attachment D is your voluntary product accessibility template or VPAT. Attachment A contains mandatory information such as a DUNS number needed for a financial review. If a respondent does not provide a DUNS number and as a result, your financial review cannot be completed, then the proposal will be rejected. Attachments B and C are scored. So please thoroughly complete them with information related to the scope of this RFO. And again, Responses are due on October 16th by 2 p.m. Central Time. Contact us immediately if you have any issues. And I just wanna make a note, on our end, we have tested our email inbox with very large submissions. I believe that goes up to 143 megabytes we've been able to receive. So we don't expect to have any issues, but please plan accordingly and do not wait until the last minute to submit your response if you think that submitting large attachments and emails may be an issue for you. Next slide, please. Before I wrap up, I want to briefly talk about your references. We require at least three references for which the respondent provided the same type of digital identity solution services from you or similar services as what you are proposing to provide to DIR. DIR recommends that you begin sending reference documents out quickly in order to meet the deadline. It is important to provide your references with the information that they will be required to submit including the qualification requirements file and the attachment F for each reference. You may want to give your references a notice that DR will be reaching out to them to discuss their experiences as part of the procurement evaluation. Please choose your references carefully. DIR is not responsible for non-responsive references. Next slide, please. And here's a final reminder to include the qualification requirements file, which should have a copy of table six pictured here and attachment F for each reference. The reference information should be completed. And again, I want to reiterate, this should match attachment F respondent release of liability. Just wanna say thank you so much. It can't be said enough. Please submit any questions that you have via the Q&A process, and we will provide a prompt response to the best of our ability. We want you to leverage this opportunity to allow you to provide your best response to this procurement. I will now turn things over to Julie, who's going to go over the evaluation criteria and process. 
Hello again, this is uh, Julie. Thank you, Jonica. Well, I wanted to uh, talk with you about what the next steps are after your response is submitted. Uh, next slide. Uh, first of all, all responses uh, are due by October 16th, 2023 by 2 p.m. Central Time. I know that we've said this a number of times, but that is a very important uh, date in time. Uh, once we uh, once we get the responses after that uh, due date has passed or the, the due time has passed, the responses are opened and they start an initial about uh, administrative re review that uh, is detailed in section 4.1. That review is looking for uh, signatures that all the re uh, uh, response documents are included, and that includes an HSP, which is a hub subcontracting plan. That is a very important document that we are going to talk about, uh, uh, or uh, uh, Lynn and Teresa are going to talk about here in just a little bit. After that a, a review, then we do a financial review, and then the actual hub review uh, begins. Section 4.2.1. Uh, contains uh, several pa uh, pass-fail criteria. So for section 3.5.12.3, we're asking for qualifications. And I do want to say that for that, we want qualifications uh, uh, for the uh, references or the qualifications that are in table five of the RFO. There is then a DUNS uh, number uh, check. This needs to be the DUNS number uh, for the submitting entity. So please uh, verify that. And the DUNS check is a pass fail uh, based on the SER score. And then as stated in the RFO, failure to provide any of these items uh, may result in disqualification. So we cannot say that enough. Uh, item number three that uh, is on here, this is the hub subcontracting plan that I mentioned a bit ago. If uh, this is not provided and signed, it is an automatic fail. Uh, and that is a, a very important um, um, piece of information to hear. And again, we will cover that here in just a little bit. And then finally, number four talks about uh, uh, the VPTS reporting. Uh, any uh, score of less than a C on BPTS being under corrective action through uh, the CPA or having uh, purchase orders terminated in the last 12 months for non-performance yeah. may result in a fail on this item. Uh, next slide. And uh, the final item uh, on the pass-fail criteria yeah. are the accessibility requirements. Uh, we will dive a little bit deeper into these a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, just right now, know that these forms are required and missing or incomplete forms may actually result in failing for this criteria. Next slide. So now we're on to the evaluation criteria from section 4.2.2 of the RFO. As you can see, we've kind of broken them down into five buckets, if you will. The technical solution is 40% of the score. Transi transition is 20. Pricing is, a, is, a, is 20 also. Experience is 10. And the proposed account organization, personal experience and quality uh, is another 10%. And uh, as uh, Wendy spoke a little bit earlier, we, we do want uh, this, this to include the the actual key personnel that you are going to uh, be proposing for this uh, response. Uh, we do uh, give a little bit of information about each of all of each of these components. We will evaluate how well the response meets or exceeds the requirements for the technical solution. We will, for transition, uh, evaluate the reasonableness in the, of the proposed transition and integration plan. The schedules will be evaluated for their reasonableness and ability to transact, transition successfully. Pricing will uh, be evaluated in accordance with the pricing instructions that are in uh, 2.1. And then for the proposed account uh, organization, we'll uh, again evaluate how the organization is structured, 
the quality of the experience that the, per that the personnel has and their individual experience level in dealing with identity management. I guess we can go to the next uh, slide. Uh, so after this uh, evaluation, what are the next steps? Uh, go to the next slide. We've got some key milestones here. We've got the responses submitted. We know we've just talked about that. We have the evaluation of the initial responses. We talked about the, diff the, the buckets of criteria and the pass-fail requirements that will, uh, will be that initial evaluation. Then there will be uh, discussion sessions after which there is a potential for an RFRO, which is, stands for a request for a revised offer. Then a down select may be possible ba uh, uh, based on the RFRO one evaluations, uh, due diligence and integration sessions, a possible another round of RFRO or request for revised offer, and then due diligence and negotiations. What's important to hear and to understand about this section that's here at the bottom of the slide in red is that we don't do BAFOs or BARFOs at DIR. We do requests for revised offers. And please, please treat each one of these as though it's your final opportunity to revise your response and pricing. This because there may not be another turn after the after the first one. And we will continue until such a point as the best value to the state is reached. And uh, next slide. Uh, the state in its discretion may hold a series of discussion sessions with respondents uh, to ensure complete and accurate understanding of the requirements and your responses to the RFRO. If you think back to the STS overview slide where we show how the MSI is the overarching integration point for the program, you can imagine that there are touch points that uh, you need to understand. And this is where the integration sessions come in. They're held uh, between or with uh, the respondent in the MSI and sometimes the other uh, uh, service component uh, providers. And the purpose of these uh, sessions is to identify gaps and overlaps in, in, the, novel, in the respondent's uh, uh, solution response and pricing. Uh, during this process, DIR uh, may provide the respondent's technical solution to the MSI and other SCPs as appropriate, but this is important to note. Please note that we will not provide your documents to other respondents. Okay, uh, well, and, and again, there's information here about uh, the, the data room. While the information, the RFO and the information located in the data room are intended to provide enough information to respond, it is the responsibility of the respondent to obtain any additional information deemed necessary. And finally, a written due diligence plan may be submitted as part of the revised response, which occurs after the initial uh, discussion sessions. Okay, next slide. As part of the RFRO, we may request oral presentations and we may work uh, as we work through the revised offer process. And these revised offers may be scored. Again, as I said, we don't do uh, BAFOs or BARFOs at DIR. We do request for revised offers. For, uh, for due diligence, um, we, we cited this a little bit earlier, it's, a it's the responsibility of the respondent to obtain all the information that needs to be complete, needs that is needed to complete their response. There is data in the data room for you to use, but if you have uh, more, you may have more questions. And due diligence is the opportunity for you to ask more complex questions regarding DIR's need and current state. The goal of, the, of due diligence is to remove all financial assumptions, reduce unknowns, and allow you to submit a more accurate revised response. Uh, DR, uh, due diligence usually runs uh, concurrently with the MSI integration sessions through to negotiations, and your due diligence plan will help facilitate that process. Next slide. <coughs> 
Uh, we move into negotiations at the conclusion of the evaluation process. DIR will determine the number of respondents with which it will start contract negotiations and negotiations will continue until the best value is obtained. For the award of the contract, DIR executive management will make the decision to award a contract if it is in the best interest of the state to do so. And this decision is final. The award for this RFRO will be posted to the ESBD under uh, the RFO number DIR-CPO-STS-576. That is the same number that Jonica mentioned at the beginning of this conference. And one final note, all responses and working papers pursuant to this RFRO are not subject to a Public Information Act uh, disclosure until all contracts re resulting from this RFRO have been executed. It's an important piece of information. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lynn. Thanks, Julie. Um, okay, we're gonna talk about the Hub Subcontracting Plan or HSP. Next slide. Okay, everyone that responds to this RFO is required to submit the hub subcontracting plan that has been provided to you um, in this RFO. If you choose not to, if you fail to complete it correctly, we will fail your response and your response will not even pass through to be evaluated. So keep that in mind. We do offer you an opportunity to have your HSP reviewed prior to the submission date. That is very exciting please take us up on that offer. We have an entire team that can walk you through how to complete the HUB subcontracting plan. They can also complete a cursory review for you on your HUB subcontracting plan to ensure you have completed it correctly. So you avoid the chance of having your HSP failed and um, your evaluation not even being reviewed. And I say this because vendors do not take us up on this as frequently as they should and we have failed several responses um, to RFOs recently. So we want you to avoid that from happening. So we're gonna walk through how you can appropriately um, complete your hub subcontracting plan. I'm gonna give you contact information so you can reach out to the team and have that plan reviewed. Next slide. Okay, so like I said, this plan is required. Um, it's a pass or fail item. So if you fail to complete it correctly, we're not going to evaluate your response. If it's passed on, your response will be evaluated. There are three ways in which you can complete the hub subcontracting plan. Um, you can self-perform, you can complete method A, or you can complete method B. You get to tell us how you can best fulfill uh, the contract and whether that includes subcontracting or not. And if you are subcontracting, what that looks like. Next slide. So you can, the goal for this uh, RFO is 26%. So if you're going to subcontract and you're going to utilize hub vendors um, and you're gonna meet or exceed that 26%, you can complete the hub subcontracting plan using method A, which means you will complete section one, section two, section four, and then method A, attachment A. And in method A, attachment A, you're gonna identify the vendors you're going to subcontract with. You're gonna provide their names. You're gonna provide their VID numbers or their EINs. And you're gonna identify the percentage of this project you're gonna subcontract to them. And you're also going to identify the approximate dollar amount. So make sure that in section two, where you've identified your subcontracting opportunities and you have said you're going to um, subcontract out 26% or more, ensure that those totals that you identify in method A, attachment A, add up to 26% or whatever you have identified in section two. I'm an Aggie, but two plus two equals four. Okay, everybody recite that with me. And in case you're unsure of the math or unsure of the sections that you have completed, you can reach out to the hub team and they will provide a cursory review for you and tell you if you've completed that plan correctly or not. Next slide. If you're gonna subcontract, 
but you're not going to meet that hub goal of 26 percent. Um, you are going to complete section one, section two, section four, and then method B, attachment B of the HUB subcontracting plan. If you're completing method B, ensure that you are soliciting a minimum of two minority trade organizations and three HUB firms, and you must allow them seven or more working days uh, for them to respond to you. Again, you get to determine who you're going to subcontract with and who you're going to use, but you must go through this uh, solicitation process and you must allow them the appropriate time to re respond to you. Or again, if you don't, if you, if you solicit these vendors three or four days before this uh, bid is due and you do not allow them enough time to respond to you, we will fail your submission. Make sure you maintain documentation of your efforts in reaching out to the minority trade organizations and the hub firms, because we can request that and you must submit that upon our request. You've got to make your good faith effort. And again, if you complete method B in your subcontracting and not meeting that hub goal, it's okay. Reach out to our hub department. We would be happy to review your HSP to ensure that you have completed the form correctly. You've allowed enough time for those entities to respond and ensure that two plus two equals four. Your math is correct. Next slide. Now you can also self-perform. Um, if you do so, you're gonna complete sections one, two, three, and four. And in section three, you're going to identify how you are going to self-perform this contract. Please don't tell us that there are not any qualified subcontractors out there. Please don't give us any of your opinions. Please don't tell us that you're going to subcontract should you be awarded this contract. I appreciate the commentary, but that is not what we're looking for in section three. We want you to identify and explain how you can best fulfill the contract. Do not refer to any sections in your response outside of the HUB subcontracting plan as we do not have access to that and cannot review that. So you've got to give us that description in section three. Um, again, please reach out to the hub team if you have questions and you would like them to review your HSP so we can avoid any chance of you um, having that, that response failed. Next slide. Okay, so I've um, included Teresa Williamson's contact information here for you to use. And we have included the DIR hub email, again, for you to use. We expect you to use that because we will review your response, your HSP plan prior to the due date for this response. So submit those questions. If you have questions about how to complete the form, if you want us to look at your form to make sure you've completed it correctly, we will do that because we love our jobs and it's our job. We're here to help you. So take us up on that offer. Um, we ask that you reach out 10 or more days prior to the due date for this bid opportunity. So you have enough time to make any corrections. Uh, so again, take us up on this offer. This is one thing that you don't have to fail. Um, we can help you complete that. We can show you how to find those minority trade organizations and those hub firms. We are here, here to assist you. So please utilize um, the hub office. And I will turn it over now to Marie. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn. I appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the digital accessibility component of the solicitation package. Um, my name is Marie Cohan. I'm the statewide digital accessibility program administrator. Next slide, please. So this is some governance around the program. Texas does have a statute, uh, chapter 2054, sub, sub chapter M, that goes over what the accessibility requirements are in the state of Texas with regard to technology. Um, that law also gives DIR authority to create some rules for agencies to follow, and that would be in TAC 206, which deals with websites, TAC 213, which deals with electronic and information resources, and this is where software and hardware will be included. We also follow industry best practices uh, and the World Wide Web Consortium. Our baseline standard is WCAG 2.0 AA. 
Um, we do require the documentation that supports these rules and guidelines, and DIR does reserve the right to request additional documentation from vendors responding to solicitations. Next slide, please. So the documents that we require are the policy-driven adoption for accessibility, which is attachment C in your packet, the um, voluntary product accessibility template, which is attachment D, is a template that needs to be completed for each product. Once it's completed, it becomes an accessibility conformance report, and that is what you'll submit with your response. Attachment E is the vendor accessibility development services information request. This is for non-product offerings, so any type of development services or any kind of coding or specialized configuration um, will require this document as well. Um, the documents are scored for completion and credibility, so please take care when completing those documents, and I will go over each one in more detail. Next slide, please. So the policy-driven adoption for accessibility is a self-assessment for the vendor. Um, you will find an Excel spreadsheet in your packet. Um, this should be completed with the organization in mind. So this particular document has nothing to do with your service offering or your product offering. This is a self-assessment of your company, how your company employs accessibility standards across the organization. Do you train your staff, especially development staff? Do you employ accessible practices in HR, procurement, IT, et cetera? Um, and that is what we're looking for on this self-assessment. You will score each area with a zero to a three. And then we take that final score and calculate it in with the um, with the pass fail score. You can also use this PDAA um, as a roadmap for your organization. If you are at an entry level uh, with your accessibility practices, this, this is a good document along with the maturity matrix. Next slide, please. This is the maturity matrix. So you can use your PDAA self-assessment to help improve your practices within your organization. Um, this matrix is available online and the link will be in the in the PowerPoint slideshow, but um, basically there's three areas there is there are actually more detail in between those three areas, but um, organizations can be at an early stage of maturity, um, they can be at a mid stage which is integrating practices and policies into their business areas, and then an optimal stage where it's become a cultural adoption throughout the organization. Next slide, please. So accessibility conformance reports. Um, like I said earlier, these are completed VPATs. The VPAT is an industry standard template. It is um, using the WCAG standards. Uh, so the WCAG standards are not just for websites. They are also used for products. Um, in order to complete a VPAT, it's recommended that a product get tested against the WCAG standards. And once you go through the, the VPAT template, um, which I'll go through in just a second, you'll see the different success criteria. You'll document how the product tested for that particular success criteria. Um, you'll complete all of those different areas. And once it's completed, it is called an accessibility conformance report. It is letting us know, letting our customers know how your product tested and conformed to the WCAG success criteria. Next slide, please. So the VPAT template is broken into four areas. Um, these four areas are the poor principles for WCAG. Um, they ensure that technology is perceivable, it's operable, understandable, and robust. Each of those areas will have different success criteria, and this is what your product would be tested against. We recommend that someone complete the VPAT who has um, strong knowledge of how the product tests against those success criteria. Next slide, please. So once your product is tested, you'll document on the template how it conformed. So did it support that success criteria? Did it partially support or support with exceptions? Did it not support? Was it not an applicable um, area for your particular product? Um, or was it not evaluated? And typically if it was not tested or evaluated, it's because it's at a higher level than we require. I will mention here, um, while the state of Texas baseline requirement is WCAG 2.0 AA, the um, state of Texas agencies and institutions of higher education have the discretion to require a higher level. Um, they may require WCAG 2.1 AA. So just make you aware of that. 
Next slide, please. So the Vendor Accessibility Development Services Information Request is for any type of development service. Um, so this can also be completed if you're going to be doing any kind of specialized customization or coding that could potentially impact um, some sort of interface for the user. Um, when you complete this, please be as detailed as possible, and I'll go through those questions in just a second. Um, and I should have mentioned on the ACR, you are required to submit an ACR for every single product that's listed on your pricing sheet. Um, if there are missing ACRs, that could be uh, uh, impacting your score. Next slide, please. The VADSER form just collects your general information about your agents or your, uh, your organization. Next slide, please. And then these are very specific questions and we do look for very detailed answers. So when we ask about um, what kind of documentation you have in key business processes, you know, you can document that you have processes for HR, IT, procurement, et cetera. Uh, when we ask about skills and training, um, please list out different types of training classes that you send your employees to, or if it's in-house training only. Um, development and testing tools. So if you test with internally your technology, what kind of tools do you use? Do you use assistive technology? Or are you just doing automated testing? Um, things like that. And then uh, any corrective action plan that you have. So when you're developing for um, a customer, what kind? Of, how do you monitor those corrective actions? How do you track those defects? Um, you know, we want to we want to understand what your process is, and and as far as the training goes, like how do your developers train? Um, what is what does your development life cycle look like, and how does it incorporate accessibility? Do you provide alternative means if there is a failure? And we also ask for some references, um, especially for our website vendors. So that may not apply here. Next slide, please. So here are some links um, for your reference. DIR does provide free training for vendors um, on accessibility practices in the state of Texas. There are four courses in the training program. Each one is about an hour long. Um, one of them is just a general digital accessibility course. Um, the other three have to do with our procurement practices in the state of Texas, especially with DIR, um, our state statutes and our state rules. So I recommend if you're not familiar with those practices, rules and guidelines um, to request a link to access the training. Um, you can have as many people in your organization trained as you would like. Um, to request that link, please email statewide accessibility at dir.texas.gov. If you email me requesting training, um, please copy uh, Jonica on that email as well. She is the procurement lead and she should be copied on all email communications. I believe that is the end of my presentation and I will turn it over to Janie Weber. Thank you so much, Marie. Good afternoon, everyone. As Marie said, I'm Janie Weber, Assistant General Counsel, and I'm here to talk about the legal side of the house of this procurement. Next slide, please. First things first, remember DIR uses a template for this contract. It's called the Master Services Agreement. And keep in mind that even though it is a template, it is subject to revisions up until the uh, prior to the final award of the contract. Please also remember that when you review this, you want to label it as part of the, you want to make sure that the exceptions are included after you review this sample. And remember that there will not be any time later to take any additional exceptions. So if you do have exceptions included as part of that, that particular RFO. Next slide, please. Also, please remember that it's really not something that we encourage to take exceptions to standard contract terms and conditions. Although we do have discretion to maybe, you know, accept or not accept the exceptions keep in mind that exceptions will be one factor considered by DIR in determining the best value for the state. Also, any exception to this document needs to be included in the respondent's response 
in the file marked ABC underscore DIR underscore RFO underscore exceptions dot DOCX. And please be sure to follow the instructions in the RFO section number 3.5127, exceptions to requirements. If there are no exceptions, please also remember to explicitly state that you are taking no exceptions to any part of this RFO. Next slide, please. This is very important. Any exception may result in the contract not being awarded to the respondent. However, we do consider some exceptions. If we determine that your excep exceptions are considered excessive in quantity or substance, those may cause you to be removed. The other factors that would uh, consider an exception for removal is in the event of a prolonged contract negotiation due to the number or and or significance of exceptions taken, lack of responsiveness or other failure to close contract negotiations on the part of the respondent that are not due to a failure on the part of DIR, DIR may in its sole discretion bypass the respondent and commence negotiations with the next highest scoring respondent or perhaps continue with the current respondent with a shorter contract term. Next slide, please. Also, vendor and all vendor representatives, please do not attempt to discuss the contents of this RFO with any employees or representatives or DIR other than your designated contacts. Failure to observe this restriction may result in disqualification of any related response. Next slide, please. We've touched on this earlier in the presentation, the importance of having the correct legal entity name. And when we say the correct legal entity name, we are referring to the name that you used to register with the Texas Secretary of State, not the DBA. However, you may include your DBA in addition to your legal entity name. Also, your, DU, your DUNS number needs to match the legal entity name and address on record with DNB to ensure that a proper match has been made. Please remember that failure to provide the correct legal name and DUNS number may lead to delays in contract award. Next slide, please. Now we're going to talk about the importance of being aware of the Public Information Act. As a state agency, DIR is subject to the Texas Public Information Act, which is found in the Texas Government Code under Chapter 552. Please be aware that when submitting your response, mark any information that is confidential, proprietary, or copyrighted. Because if that information is not clearly marked, it may be subject to being released under the Texas Public Information Act. Please consult your legal counsel on this matter and also follow the instructions in the RFO section 3.5.9 entitled Public Information. Next slide, please. Well, that about wraps up the legal side of the house. And I believe I will be handing this now back to Jonica. Thank you so much, Janie. I really appreciate that. Uh, we do not want to limit or, or minimize the legal importance of filling out the items correctly and using your correct name. Next slide, please. Now, we are almost done with the presentation, but I wanted to touch on some additional best practices at this point. 
Um, please remember to reference the RFO page number and section number when you are submitting your questions. It's super helpful for us to know where you're talking about and what you are talking about. Uh, and I want to say again that the questions answered today when we have our, our Q&A feature are unofficial until they are posted on the ESBD website in the form of an addendum. Speaking of the ESBD, please check it often. We're going to be updating it often and any addenda that we do post will be posted there. And as a very stern reminder, all questions regarding this RFO must be submitted in writing via email to the enterprise 576 at dir.texas.gov email address. We do have a similar email address that ends in a different number. So please make sure that you are using the enterprise 576 number when submitting your emails. Next slide, please. For inquiries regarding this RFO, you're going to be contacting me, Jonica Moffadon. I am available at the Enterprise 576 email inbox. If you have any questions regarding your hub subcontracting plan, please utilize Teresa Williamson at the dir.hub or hub at dir.texas.gov email address. These are the only DIR personnel with whom respondents may discuss this RFO. And if you do have any hub subcontracting plan questions, please remember to include me at the Enterprise 576 email address when you submit those questions. Super important. Next slide, please. Now, we have arrived at the portion of this conference call that has been reserved for asking your questions. And we do see that there are quite a few questions that have been included in the chat. Thank you so much for providing those. Um, and you do have a couple of more seconds to add some more questions um, if you feel the need to. I do want to reiterate again that your questions should have been submitted using the Q&A function for this call in Zoom and should include the RFO page number and section if possible. And please note any answers provided live in this moment are unofficial until posted to the ESBD as part of an addendum. So, I see the questions in the chat and I'm just going to start at the top and work my way down if that is okay. Um, and I've, I've just been a question. Are we taking a quick break? My apologies. I got really excited about the questions. We're going to take a five minute break. It is 333 according to my clock. We will take a five minute break so you can add some questions to that. Thanks team. And once that time is concluded, we will answer those questions live if possible. So we're just going to take a minute to pause. Enjoy your quick five minute break. I will come back on here at 3.38.
Okay, everyone, we are back. Thank you so much for uh, allowing for the pause and for submitting additional questions. So we're just gonna start at the top and work our way down. So the question is, the IAM solution must be hosted in DCS. Is this an on-prem data center, cloud-based, if so, public or private, or a hybrid data center consisting of an on-prem DC with cloud? This is Wendy Maserana. The IAM solution is currently hosted within the public cloud. Okay, next question. Uh, who is the MSI for STS, TDIS, and IAM? That is Cap Gemini. Next question. Who will be the customers? Is it agencies internal to the state of Texas? The customer definition can be found in exhibit one in the definitions table. Uh, can this deck be shared or recording be shared? Yes, the deck, the recording, the attendees, and the YouTube link to this recording will all be posted to the ESPD shortly. The next question, is the NDA for digital data room at the company level covering employees or at the individual level? So. This is a great question, and we would like to cover this question in the um, in an addendum just to ensure that we are providing the most up-to-date response on that. Does not does hitting not hitting the twenty six percent target for the contract going to hub hub firms affect the scoring of responses so long as the HSP is properly submitted? i.e. does the final hub percentage fall under one of the five evaluation factors? Hi, this is Teresa Williamson. Um, your hub subcontracting plan is, um, it is not scored. It is a pass or fail and a require, a pass or fail document and it is a required document. Um, this is where you will tell us how you will best fulfill a contract should you be awarded. Thank you, Teresa. Um, how can the first time emerged company who have not had experience or requirements demonstrated of $1 million business for three years participate in this RFO? Uh, it is recommended that you try to partner up with a, another interested um, company. Um, at, that would probably be your best bet is to phone a friend and do some sort of partnering with another company. Uh, next question. Can you provide the Forge Rock components that are currently in use? This is Susie Hilliard. Um, that information is located in the data room um, or data room, however you prefer to say that. Um, and you will need to make sure that you get an NDA before getting access to that da data room. Thank you, Susie. Uh, will the recording of this presentation be made available? Yes. Next question. Should the company be listed in the Texas Smart Buy? Um, that is not a specific requirement that you be listed there. Um, so there you go. Next question. The main RFO document 3.3 .3 schedule of events, when or how quickly Will the DIR provide answers back to respond in RFO questions? So we are doing our very best to answer those questions as quickly as possible. All answers to questions submitted will be posted via an addendum um, as soon as we have the opportunity to do so. Next question. Uh, to clarify, you require only onshore resources to conduct all work. Is there specific legal immigration status that staff must have? Uh, that is a great question. I would. In Jonica, per exhibit yes, one, all services and data must remain within the United States. Please, we would prefer to defer the rest of the question to the official Q&A to ensure that our um, response is 100% compliant and not lead y'all down um, in an accurate path. So please hold on the remainder. 
Thank you, Wendy. Do we have to offer pricing for existing license as well? Um, for example, Forge Rock, or can we just focus on solutions we bring in? Jody, would you like to take a shot at this or we can defer? I think we talked about this. This is walking in and taking over. So we are expecting them to take over the Forge Rock uh, contracts. Thank you, Jody. Uh, will the incumbent be allowed to respond to the RFO? Um, we would like to reference back to the preclusions um, that are clearly stated in um, section, I believe, 1.1 of the RFO for that. Next question. Is there a specific requirement for in-person presence at designated physical locations, or is this at an as-needed basis. Uh, we do address this in the RFO, but just to be safe, um, we want to make sure to clearly respond to this question um, more formally in an addendum. Next question, does the vendor need to consider hosting or will it be provided by DIR? Um, document name 13, exhibit one, SOW DIR CPO STS 576T to Senayama, version 1.1 doc. Section 2.8, infrastructure hosting. And Jonica, this is Wendy, I'll take this one. The infrastructure must be hosted within the data center services program. And I will add to that, it is currently in the public, in the, in the public cloud uh, PCM component of the DCS program and the architecture information can be, can be found in the data room. And this is Jody. I'll add to that. We covered that during the pricing slides that the PCM uh, vendor bills DIR directly. So we would not want you to include any infrastructure in your price. Thanks, team. Uh, the next question is in reference to 4.23a. If the company is not registered in Texas Smart Buy and does not have the VPTS report, is the company still? Qualified. I believe we have addressed this earlier, um, but we will thoroughly address this in a Q&A addendum. Next question. Does the support include 24-7 support for TDIS or 8 by 5 with on-call support for critical issues? Exhibit 1 requires 24 by 7 support. Thank you, Wendy. Next question. For the main RFO document, 2-1 scope. Can we provide a service organization overview and a service catalog of supported requests that are in scope for the incumbent in support of the current solution? Uh, that information is hosted in the data room? Yep. Thanks, Thanks Wendy. Wendy. You beat me to the mute button. <laughs> me as well. <laughs> Next question. Do we have a high level architecture diagram uh, that you can share or better understand the scope the successful respondent will be supporting? So a lot of the architecture questions and the, uh, the, the architecture questions and the um, design of the system that all those, all that information can be located in the data room. Thanks, Susie. And Jonica, I'm not sure if you noticed, but we feel like some of the Additional questions that are coming in may best be deferred until we've had an opportunity to review them as a group and respond in writing. Ab absolutely agree with you, Jody. Um, so we will go ahead and address the remaining questions um, after we have the opportunity to officially um, provide a accurate response and put them in an addendum. So thank you all for submitting these questions. These are great questions. And we really appreciate um, the chance to answer them live. Uh, so we can go to the next slide, please. So as a reminder, any questions that we just covered are considered unofficial until we are posted on the Electronic State Business Daily or the ESBD in the form of an addendum. Any changes or additional information regarding this RFO will be posted as an addendum to requisition number DIR CPO STS 576 on the ESPD. And I've included the link to that site. 
it is the responsibility of vendors to monitor the ESBD website for addenda regularly, early and often. Next slide, please. So this is a reminder for the schedule. So I want to reiterate, if you do have any burning questions, please submit them now and submit them often. The official Q&A deadline for questions is October 2nd at 2 p.m. But before you submit your questions, remember to check the data room. There is a treasure trove of valuable information waiting for your exploration in there. So utilize the data room. It, that is a great option. And I just want to do a quick, quick test uh, just to check for understanding. Um, if anyone would like, can someone come off of mute and let me know when your responses are due? You can come off mute if you'd like to answer. Any takers? Ah, you probably can't come off of mute. <laughs> October 16th at 2 p.m. Thank Central you. Time. Yes. I appreciate that. Yes, October 16th at 2 p.m. is the response deadline. And next slide. I just want to say thank you so much for spending almost two hours with us today. Um, we really appreciate your time, your attention, your questions. It's all been extremely valuable, and we are looking forward to having amazing responses to this RFO. Um, I want to give you a quick reminder that all questions and inquiries must be directed to me, Jonica Amafadun, at the email listed. And just to reiterate, that is enterprise576 at dir.texas.gov. And this will formally conclude today's conference. This presentation, the YouTube recording link, and attendance list will be posted, again, the presentation, the recording link, and the attendees list will be posted to the ESBD. We will also include any questions in an addenda with that posting. And we just wanna say thank you so much for attending and hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks everyone. <laughs>